Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 460, Clinical Treatment of Postmenopausal Bleeding. BioBalance Health features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Moppin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Moffin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the newly released book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of T replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Moffin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Moffin's office is currently accepting new patients. Women, as they age, age out of fertility. And so they eventually stop having periods every month. But for some women, after they've stopped having their period and are considered to be postmenopausal, they will occasionally bleed. And that's frightening. That's distressing. It's uh, like, why is this happening? It, it's not predictable in the way that their periods were predictable, especially if they were on, the, on a pill. They would know, next Tuesday I'm going to start. I uh-huh. need to be prepared. I need to have something with me. When they're beyond that stage of their life, they're like, well, I don't need to prepare for that. I'm not going to do that anymore. Then they start bleeding, and they're like, okay, is something wrong? Uh-huh. And sometimes you'll get a panic call at the uh-huh. office. I'm, I'm spotting. I'm bleeding. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, what, what is this, and what do I need to do about it? And you especially get those conversations, not just because you're a gynecologist, but because you specialize in men and women who are aging Mm -hmm. and the issues that come up in our lives as we age. And one of the issues that comes up strongly at your office is what do you do about bleeding in postmenopausal women? So one of the biggest risks of giving a woman estradiol or estrogen to solve the problems of menopause, the hot flashes, the dry vagina, the painful intercourse... All of those are are postmenopausal low estrogen symptoms. And oftentimes, most of the time, we give estrogen back to our patients to solve these problems. Now, the biggest risk factor or the biggest chance of having something go wrong in women with a uterus is that they will bleed after menopause. And that's unacceptable to some women. Like, they they won't take estrogen if they have a chance of bleeding ever Then there's women who will, well, if it happens, then what can we do about it? And we have many ways to troubleshoot this. So so a woman has a choice. She can say, I'm not going to take estrogen Mm -hmm. because I don't want the bleeding issue. Mm -hmm. But if she makes that choice, then she's more likely to have these other symptoms that you're talking about. Right. Then she's going to still have hot flashes. She's still going to have dry vagina. She's still going to have painful intercourse which means she probably won't have intercourse because it hurts so badly. It feels like sandpaper to women. So So, you take the risk of never having sex again in your life mm -hmm. or or being in pain every time you try to have sex, or do you take the risk of occasionally having a bleeding problem? Right. And and honestly, I don't get that, but I accept it. If someone says, I'm not coming to you because you're going to ask me to take estrogen, which I I will present the uh, opportunity to take estrogen, but I'm not going to ever take it because it's going to cause me to bleed. And I'm not ever doing that again. And I'm thinking, but you're miserable. (laughs) And you don't, your husband's not happy. And your life, your life is miserable because you're sweating every five seconds. That doesn't make sense to me. I think it's it's worth taking estrogen. And then, but you, but you're not trying to sell them on your point of view. I just want them to feel good. Information (laughs) and, and data about what's going on. Why, why is this happening? Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, when we were prepping for this, you gave me a lot of information mm-hmm. about the chemical balancing job, mm-hmm. the triage that you have to do to keep somebody in the zone where mm-hmm. their bodies maximize what they can do. What, before and, we, had, we try to get people back to the same kind of balance that they had before menopause, but not with cycles anymore, just with a low level of estrogen, a low level of progesterone, and a balance all the time to keep their uterus estrogenized, but just barely estrogenized so that they don't bleed. So so, so the estrogen does what to the uterus? Okay, so the estrogen, very, very good. So the estrogen- It's written right here. In, yeah. any, in, any, <laughs> in any woman's body is going to make the lining of the uterus thicken. Okay. Now- what that does for us when we're cycling is it, it builds a lining so that when 
an egg is fertilized, it has a place to burrow in and then start it makes developing. It, it makes a nest. For it the, makes for a the nest. Egg. Right. So that's what the estrogen does. It is. It goes up throughout a cycle, and then right before a period, if you haven't conceived, it drops drastically, and that causes the lining of the uterus so, to So there's like a 36-hour window for an egg after it's released, uh, ovulation, mm -hmm. to be fertilized. Right. If it's not fertilized in that window, then the chemistry inside the uterus automatically knows to change, mm -hmm. and it decreases the estrogen so that that thicker lining, that nest that's been created, can drain away. It's, it starts, uh, the egg starts um, dissolving, basically, and the lining becomes unstable. And then as that egg doesn't burrow into the lining, then it is shed with the, the little cells that the egg, the cell that the egg right. was. So basically it's gotten out of the way so that the next month, there's a whole new lining another in the cycle. uterus, so Pre another the, cycle. You build it, mm -hmm. and it tears itself down. So we have an opportunity to get pregnant once a month. Right. So that's why we bleed, and it, it is not because we were doomed to be females. It, we have the honor of being the mother of children, so that's what we have to pay for it, basically, is to have periods. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're menopausal, you don't have estrogen, and you don't make, you don't ovulate, and you don't make eggs anymore. Your ovaries just kind of... Get, go to sleep, and that's where, where estrogen and progesterone come from. But what we used to have to balance our estrogen was progesterone. Halfway through the month, when the egg was ovulated, our ovaries made progesterone, and it balanced out that estrogen. So, and, so my understanding is you, you have a lifetime supply of eggs. Yes. I mean, a set number. I mean, but it's not, not automatic for everybody. <laughs> but, but does your supply of eggs run out? At the same time that you go into menopause? Does yes. that mean there are no more eggs right. and that's all then part of that's a, exactly a what process? That's exactly what it means. It means okay. that we're out of eggs, we're out of estrogen, because you, when the egg is developing, that's when we make estrogen. And we're out of progesterone. We don't make progesterone anymore. So wow. that comes from the ovary as well. So basically, unlike men who make testosterone throughout their life, it may not be at a high level, but they always make testosterone. Right. We stop making estrogen and progesterone and testosterone because that comes from the ovary as well. Mm -hmm. So our ovaries shrink. When we went in to do surgery on somebody's pelvis, the ovaries that were menopausal look like little tiny almonds, basically, mm -hmm. kind of kind of like they were scarred. Yeah. So and they or you could just feel them barely. So they were almost gone. They don't work anymore. And so then are there other benefits that the body gets from estrogen that don't have to do with just the cycle and the preparation for nesting e uh, eggs that are fertilized? Mm -hmm. it, uh, besides the job it does for the uterus and for making babies, it gives us um, a wet vagina so that we can have intercourse, and it thickens the lining of the vagina so that it doesn't, it's not thin and irritated every time there's friction like with an intercourse. It thickens the bladder so that there's no irritation uh, of the bladder. So many people after menopause, all of a sudden they can't hold their urine. It, it just kind of squirts out because they have no estrogen. When they cough or they laugh or something. Even when they don't. When they're, yeah. just, when they're just sitting here, their uterus will start, will, will start being irritable yeah. because there's no estrogen. Now, both estrogen and testosterone do this job. One alone does it somewhat. But two of them together make it back to your normal self. So we're back self. to the chemistry shit thing. You've got right. to get the right balance. You have to have and the right balance. it's different for each woman based on her weight or size or age, her genetics. Right. Everybody has a kind of a perfect estrogen level. Uh -huh. When we give pellets and we check somebody's estrogen level, and we want to check it to see where she's happiest, where everything's working, where her skin is, her skin is soft. It also does that. Or it also stimulates breast development or breast fullness so that women's breasts look more young when they have estrogen and, the, and more firm. That's just part of what estrogen does. But we don't want to give them so much that it's going to cause their uterus to build a really thick lining and set my patient up for bleeding. Right. But some people feel good with a high, high level of estrogen and some feel good with a low level of estrogen. So what we do is the magic hormone is progesterone. We match the progesterone to the estrogen level. If a patient loves estrogen, she feels best when it's at her blood levels at 200, then I'm going to give that patient a lot of progesterone 
to balance it so it doesn't get too thick. Progesterone lowers the lining of the uterus. Estrogen raises it. So, so together, if you keep the lining the right thickness, then there's not going to be a bleeding problem? Right. Because it's not going to slew off and tear away. Right. But, but the reason doctors worry about the lining of the uterus and bleeding is interesting. Uh, we always worry about the worst thing that can happen, and that is there's a 9%. Now, nine people out of 100. Right who bleed postmenopausally will have uterine cancer. Now, that's not a very that's not a very high percentage bleed regularly, to worry bleed about. Once in a while? No, ever just bleed? no, just um, bleed such that they have to go to the doctor and be evaluated. Okay. Some people will spot a little bit and then stop for 5 years mm-hmm. and then spot a little bit. That doesn't tend to be an issue, but but in this study it was people who have been menopausal for quite a while and then they start bleeding. Right. So of those people, and that's usually real, not just spotting, but real bleeding, uh, like a period, then they would be evaluated. Nine out of 100 would have uterine cancer. That's not very much. And if they were taking estrogen and progesterone, then they had a lower risk of uterine cancer, not a higher risk. So in my field, doctors think for some reason that estrogen is going to cause uterine cancer. Right. But it doesn't. In fact, it saves people from uterine cancer right. because we give them this progesterone with it, and they have a lower rate of cancer. So, so it's seven percent for women who are taking um, taking estrogen and testosterone and uh, progesterone in any in any form. Yeah. But it's twelve percent in women who take nothing after menopause. It's safer to take seven percent or twelve percent. Right. Okay. I mean, if you're if you're worried about the nine percent, which is in the middle, right. Then choose choose what you want to do. You can save yourself uterine cancer if you take estrogen. So, uh, so what do we do when someone calls us? <laughs> well, what's a DNC? Oh, I hear okay. that term all the time, and I don't know that I know what it is. Okay, so so the uterus is like um is like an upside down pear. You know, the biggest mm-hmm. part at the top, and there's and there's an opening at the bottom, which is this in the cervix. There's a little opening. You can't you can't put a finger through it. It's a little tiny opening, and that's the opening that the uterine lining sheds through, right? Okay. Well, it's a really tight opening. It doesn't just – we can't go in and go, oh, I think we'll just stretch it here. That hurts a lot. It's kind of like labor pains. It's cramping. So you can't go into some – into an office and just go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dilate the cervix, which is D, and I'm going to curatage, which is cleaning it out like you're cleaning out a – Cantaloupe, basically like, like a, scraper, a cantaloupe just, scraper, like yeah. a, a cantaloupe spoon, kind of. Yeah. That's that's how we clean it out, or we use a little suction device. So that's how you do a DNC. You go into it, and you go into the operating room, put somebody to sleep for just a few minutes, then put them into lithotomy position with their legs up, and the speculum's placed in the vagina so you can see the cervix, and then you dilate the cervix with some little blunt dilators to make it big enough to get in this spoon and then you scrape it and then take all the scrapings out and send it to pathology and say, is there cancer there? Right. But it does two things. It tells us if there's any problem, which obviously is not a high risk of a problem, but it also cleans the uterus out so we can start over. So that... And then you have a chance to get the balance right if you're if you're using the estrogen and right. the progesterone so, and the testosterone. Right. So then okay. when we give the estrogen, uh, progesterone and testosterone, then we can recover that lining. Right. Now, having said that, sometimes um, people don't need a DNC who bleeds. Sometimes they can go into their doctor's office, and they put this tiny little straw into the uterus and suction out some tissue and send that away. It doesn't clean the uterus out completely, but it will suction out the tissue and send it to pathology and say, is this cancer? Right. That's all it'll tell you. So if, if you do these things and you stop the bleeding problem, Will you still have uh, hot flashes unless you get uh, an estrogen progesterone replacement? Well, it- if if you have if you've had these and you were on hormones, then when you get it all cleaned out, you weren't having hot flashes because you were on hormones, and you still aren't having hot flashes. Right. And basically, you feel better. The uterus itself is not harmed. But if you don't take the hormones, will you keep having the hot flashes? Yeah, most people do. 
Right. Not everybody. There's a few people that'll have them for a few years and then stop. But I have people who are 80 that have been having them for 20 years. Oh my gosh. Without hormones. Now, when we give them hormones, they're like, "Woo! Why didn't I do that again? Yeah. You know, a long time ago." Right. That's that's like I feel normal now. So, so the workup for somebody who has postmenopausal bleeding, generally. It's more than a year after menopause. Generally, it's significant bleeding, not just spotting. We do an ultrasound. We look inside the uterus. That's the first thing. And we look to make sure there's no fibroids or polyps. Polyps are like little punching bags that hang down from the lining of the uterus, kind of like people have polyps in their colon, polyps in their nose, right. polyps everywhere. So if we see one of those, then generally that has to be scraped out in the operating room with a DNC. Yeah. But if we see a fibroid, sometimes that fibroid is growing and bleeding. And sometimes that actually indicates a hysterectomy because if the patient wants to not bleed. So a fibroid fib from fiber is fibrous. Fibrous. But it's what? A, I mean, fibroid is, is a, my own, uh, it's a muscle fibrous mass that is, is not cancer. It's just a mass that doesn't respond to hormones like progesterone like it should, like should the lining those does. those have to be removed, or can you tolerate those? Sometimes you can tolerate them. You can take more progesterone. Sometimes we can give you other medicine to actually decrease the growth of them. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes, estrogen stimulates them, and people will bleed. So, so if somebody comes in, I mean, it's like a detective story. Somebody comes in with bleeding. Mm -hmm. You have a chest checklist of concerns that you have to eliminate. Mm -hmm. and, and you start with an exam? We, yeah, we start, well, we don't, we actually coming. send people to gynecologists, but when I was a gynecologist, right. we, um, and I send people to a gynecologist with blood work, telling them what their blood levels are of their, of their estrogen and their progesterone. Then we, uh, as a gynecologist, I would, I would examine that patient, see how big the uterus is, look to see if there's a polyp. Sometimes polyps are just hanging out. We can just go get them. I then, uh, check the ovaries to make sure there's no masses. And oftentimes, I still can't tell why they're bleeding. So then I have to do an ultrasound. I look inside the uterus. I can tell if the lining's thick or thin. Then after that, I decide whether I'm going to do a little endometrial biopsy in the office or a DNC in the operating room. And that's how we take care of them. So, so in our prep notes for this, we mm -hmm. have a list of nine things under what's the cause of postmenopausal bleeding. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of your triage list, your right. checklist mm -hmm. of things that you want to know about or interventions that, that you will make. And we'll mm -hmm. post, post them here mm -hmm. behind us so they can see them. Uh, let's run through those quickly and make sure we've touched on them. I think we've covered so, a lot of them already. Well, we want to know if somebody's got too thick or thin a lining. So that's too much estrogen or not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, you can bleed from both. Uterine polyps, those little punching bags, uterine fibroids. Right. And th then there's something called a spongy uterus. This is hard to diagnose. Sometimes you can see it on ultrasound. Sometimes you can't. But women who have had a lot of pregnancies, not necessarily a lot of children, but a lot of placentas digging into the lining, can get a spongy uterus that just fills up with blood and then, and then contracts, and then they flood with blood. Even if they're menopausal, if they have any estrogen at all, that uh -huh. sometimes happens. Okay. That's another reason that they might need a That's hysterectomy. That's spongy. It fills up like a sponge, fills mm -hmm. up with water. Right. Fills yeah. up with blood. Yeah. So um, then you can have inadequate vitamin K. Oftentimes women do have that. Vitamin K is, is necessary for you to clot your blood. So if you can't clot your blood and you have a uterus, whether you're getting estrogen or not, you, you might have bleeding. So we have to make sure you're clotting your blood. So vitamin and K. And you correct that by giving them vitamin K? Yeah, by giving them vitamin K and vitamin C. No, it's not K2 either. We give K2 for bones, but this is just straight vitamin K. Okay. So, and we also give vitamin C because that helps the cross links um, of of the lining, so they're stable, so they don't just drip, basically drip blood. So that's important to know. They're not bleeding because of an inadequate uh, vitamins, but there's also medications that make them make people bleed. If you're on um, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory like Motrin, but was, there are some that are prescription. Those can, those can actually cause bleeding and inhibit your clotting ability. Or warfarin. Warfarin is... If you're is, worried about blood clots and heart attacks and strokes. Right. Sometimes we, we place people or other doctors place people on warfarin, and we need to know about that or any kind of uh, treatment for um, blood clots or um, even, even superficial blood clots can cause your uterus to bleed because you don't 
clot your blood. I had an elderly professor when I was in college that everybody was concerned about. He went to the hospital for bleeding, and they were concerned that he had cancer and he was going to die. Mm -hmm. It turned out he was eating aspirin like candy. (laughs) And it was rupturing his, his stomach blood vessels, uh-huh. and he was bleeding as a result of that. Uh-huh. that I mean, yeah, you can't. You, you should always read the directions and not go over it. But um, the other things that can cause bleeding can be a platelet deficiency. Some people who have leukemia or lymphoma or um, who actually have ITP, it's an autoimmune disease that, that kills your platelets, that can cause you to bleed as well. So would this be a thing that you might discover that they may not know that they have mm-hmm. by doing their blood test mm-hmm. if they start bleeding? I mean, that could be the, mm-hmm. the trigger symptom right. that, that says, hey, we have a real problem here. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes, we'll see no pl- very low platelets, and, right. and if they get down to 25,000 or less on the test, then you can start bleeding spontaneously. Okay. Anywhere. So uter- mm. uterus is one of those things. So this is your passion in part because you have 30 years in as a gynecologist, mm-hmm. but in part because you are now specializing in anti-aging medicine. And the focus of your practice is individualized treatment with a patient that you know, you know their symptoms, their issues, their lifestyle. It's, it's not a high volume mass production, give somebody a prescription and, and send them away. Mm-hmm. And when somebody who comes to you does report bleeding and they're postmenopausal mm-hmm. and they don't, mm-hmm. uh, they, they have a uterus, uh, your first recommendation then is to send them to their gynecologist, their regular gynecologist, mm-hmm. with your blood tests. Right. To say, have these conversations mm-hmm. with your gynecologist because she's going to be the first line of intervention for what has to happen next. Right. When I started doing this, I stopped doing the things that gynecologists do. Right. And so I don't, I don't have the specialty skills now to do that. So I send people back to their gynecologist or they don't have one to someone who's a friend of mine who is good at taking care of this, who can help me with that. So well, one, I, one I the, have to use the specialty. Like if you had a brain tumor, I'd send you to a neurosurgeon. You know, I ha- it's the same thing. I don't do that anymore. So I have to send people for that. And one of the bittersweet lessons that you've learned is that you have to have a cadre of physicians that know what you do mm-hmm. and believe in what you do. Mm-hmm. Because there are a lot of doctors out there that will tell their patients, oh, you shouldn't go to her to get your hormones replaced mm-hmm. because of all these fears. Or you should never have your hormones replaced, which is exactly. obviously we just showed here that if you don't take estradiol or estrogen, right. then you're at higher risk for uterine cancer. I mean, that's, that, that's not what gynecologists were taught 10 years ago. And so they may not have learned. The they may not have caught up to. I mean, the schools are rarely caught up to where the practice of medicine is. Right. So, basically, what we wanted you to hear is that if you have postmenopausal bleeding concerns, it's important to find out what's going on. Mm-hmm. It could be deadly. It most often is not. And there are interventions and treatments that can ameliorate those concerns. And then you, as a woman and your physician, have to make a decision. What payoff do you want? Because if you if you take the hormone replacements, you may have some other concerns. If you don't take the hormone replacements, you'll definitely have some concerns. Mm-hmm. So, you know, pay your money, pick your choice. <laughs> anyway, hopefully this will be useful for stimulating a conversation between you and your physician if postmenopausal bleeding ever becomes a concern for you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.